Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for for taking the time to let me interview you. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Okay, so I do have a few questions for you, and I won't take up too much of your time. Okay, so let's let's get started. So, you know, I'm mainly going to be talking about your book, The Soul of an Octopus, of course. I know you've written a couple more, and your book on the pink dolphins was fabulous. I absolutely love that book. Thank you. (laughs) So... So I guess I'll start by talking about, or maybe just asking you, like, for writing Soul of an Octopus, what made you interested in writing about octopuses in general? Well, I've always been interested in um, animals' cognition, um, the individuality of animals, the idea that, you know, animals are just as, as valuable as people that they have integrity that they love their lives as we do and i thought as a vehicle to explore consciousness in the animal world what better animal could i pick than an intelligent invertebrate so close you know so closely related to clams and snails yet whose intelligence we recognize. I think every animal has its own intelligence, but it's not always so like our own that we recognize it. And this was a great way to probe that. That's fa- that's really, really, you know, I hadn't thought about it that way, but that's, that's very accurate as far as intelligence and whatnot. I'm curious, have you read the book um, How Animals Grieve by Barbara King? You know, when you called, I was just corresponding with her on email. Oh, yes, she's fabulous. Oh. She's a wonderful person. Mm. I took her to the aquarium at New, <laughs> New England, and she met... God, did she meet Rudy, or did she meet Freya? Anyway, yeah, um, we've spoken together on panels. I just read her newest manuscript, um, oh. which is about how we can help animals. Oh, perfect. It's being published by University of Chicago Press. Okay. Um, and the title is still up in the air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll keep my absolutely. eyes open for We're it. We're on the same page. <laughs> I just, sure. when you were saying that, that's that's what made me think of that book was her, How Animals Grieve. So mm. I'm Such curious, a book. more in general though, because, you know, you've been writing books for a while now, is how you got into writing more popular science. Was it more just kind of telling a story or from your own experiences? How did that happen? Well, um... I trained, I I went to college, I triple majored, one of my majors was magazine journalism. When I got out of school, I wanted a job on a newspaper and got one. Within a year, I was covering science and medicine, which included environment. There weren't a lot of animal stories, but uh, learning to write about science, learning to tell a story to what we call in the news business the Kansas City milkman, you know, the person mm. who doesn't necessarily have a PhD, but who's just as smart as you and I, and maybe smarter, but you don't want to to fail to connect to this person because you're choosing to use words that nobody understands. So um, writing for a newspaper really, really helped prepare me to do what I really wanted to do. Well, after I'd worked for five years for the newspaper, this was a small paper, 60,000 circulation in New Jersey, uh, called the Courier News. My father, who had always been my hero and my savior, gave me a ticket to Australia where I'd always wanted to go on a vacation. And I joined the organization Earthwatch, which pairs paying laymen with scientific volunteer opportunities around the world and worked on a wombat preserve in South Australia. And I loved it so much that, you know, they, I worked my tail off. And (laughs) the researcher, Dr. Pamela Parker, who was then with Brookfield Zoo in Chicago, in the US, told me, you know, I I wish I could pay you to come back and assist us because you work like a dog and you love this. She said, I wish that I could pay for your ticket to come back and volunteer, but I can't. But if you ever wanted to do scientific research on your own, you could stay at my camp and I would give you food. So I went back to my job and quit and got a tent and moved to the outback where I studied emus. I just followed them around all day to see what they did. And 
I didn't know I was going to study emus when I got there. I just knew that something would show up. And sure enough, one day I looked up and there were these three emus strolling by me as I was collecting plants, helping another researcher while I tried to figure out what I was doing. I was alone. She'd sent me to the site to to collect the plants where they were going to be burned and weighed and their nitrogen content figured out. And most of the time, there were so few people in camp that you were not with other people most of the time, which suits me just fine. Now I looked up and these emus walked by and I was like, oh my God, I, I, I really want to know what their lives are like. And I didn't even think that I'd be able to follow them around. I thought I would be studying their scat to see you know, because I could certainly find their scat mm. um, to see what they'd been eating. But it turned out that I could follow them around and they did allow me to apprentice myself to them. And they let me follow them um, not quite as close as you would walk next to a person, but I could walk in back of them just a matter of paces. And they kind of let me into their group. These three were probably siblings, they were youngsters. And uh, they trusted me after a while. That was just an amazing thing. And <laughs> after that, I lived for six months in the tent and, and did this study. And and after six months, you know, I had no money. So I knew I, I, I could go back to the newspaper and I had loved doing that work, but I just wasn't going to be able to struggle in a stupid pantyhose all day. So I decided to work for myself. My husband, um, my boyfriend at that time, He'd been freelance ever since we both graduated from Syracuse University. He had a book contract right out of college. And he'd moved all our stuff up to New Hampshire. So we were living in this carriage house in New Hampshire, and I was freelance writing. And within, a, within I guess, about a year, <laughs> I had a contract for my first book. Now, the contract, that doesn't mean anything necessarily because, you know, they can give you $1.85. In fact... The, the the contract, as you know, when you sell a book, you just get a certain amount of money up front. Mm. Uh, and I needed to go to like four countries in Africa and to Europe and Canada and Borneo <laughs> <laughs> um, to do this book that I imagined. But, you know, you find you find the money. And after I'd already gone to Borneo, I came back and discovered my publisher wasn't going to publish trade books anymore. So A, I wasn't going to get the, any more money out of them. And B, they weren't even going to publish me. But my agent then, with the, the help of somebody who I had met, and who is now my best friend, Elizabeth Marshall Thomas, we sold it to Houghton Mifflin for a, a more decent amount of money. And uh, that first book was Walking with the Great Apes. It was a... yeah story of you know the three ape ladies who helped us really understand animals in a way we hadn't before no that's that's fabulous what a non-linear journey in a sense you're doing things you didn't expect but that's how it goes i think you you can't plan for these things right right but i did you know i did kind of know what uh, i did have a vision and i write about this a little bit i wrote a book called um how to be a good creature that mm. came out, I guess a year ago fall. Mm. And I write a little bit about in that book, the book is about all the animal teachers that I've had. And I think if I have any talent at all, it is to recognize a teacher when I find one, and, you know, uh, that we're surrounded by teachers but because we expect them to be in a classroom and not be somebody with eight arms or somebody with four legs or uh, some shaman in the Amazon or you know we, we we miss out realizing that we're surrounded by those who have so much to teach us and at least that is one thing that I know Absolutely. No, that's that's absolutely true. I'm curious as far as, you know, you have a very good and, um, you know, very written, well-written perspective on octopuses. And I'm curious, do you think that 
people's perspectives on octopuses in general have been tainted in the past by the media or by movies or things like that because clearly you know there is somewhat of a disconnect oh yeah you're so right and who can blame them how would they you know how do you how do you know very few people get to actually meet an octopus i mean think of how our perspectives have been tainted about uh other people Mm -hmm. around the world I mean, think of the the horrible prejudice against Africans and African Americans that still continues to this day. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's it's amazing. And uh, think of somebody who lives who lives in the sea, who can change color and shape, and would rather most of the time melt away and not be seen. How are we supposed to learn about them? So, yeah, I think I think that um, movies and Victor Hugo and (laughs) Um, you know, that, that famous pen and ink uh, drawing by Guy de Montfort um, of the octopus attacking the mass of a ship. Mm-hmm. You know, of course those things affect us. Sure. No, absolutely right. And I know your book, when it first came out, had a really nice large public response after it. And of course it won a couple of awards, I believe, if I remember correctly. Were you expecting yeah. such a large public response to your book being published? Well, no. I mean, gosh. I think, like, well, I don't, I don't know most writers, but like many of us, I didn't expect anything. I just expected. Here I was bearing witness to the friendships that I had, and there it was. Mm-hmm. I had no idea that it would become a bestseller. My neither did my publisher. <laughs> my publisher did not give me a national book tour. Um, I financed it. My husband and I financed it. So it, it came as a big surprise. Sure. I, uh, of course. I mean, that that makes sense. But, you know, it is, as you say, a bestseller, which is wonderful in the sense that it's still being read. People are still really enjoying it. So I know you said you published a book last year. Is there a book you're currently working on or are you still working on the publicity for that book? Oh, no. Yeah, there's um. My husband and I both are always working on a book. We can't not be working on a book. I'm working on three right now. Oh, my goodness. Um, and I've got a new two books coming out this year. Oh, so, wow, Sai. Okay, I will keep my eyes open for those. Yeah, well, I've, you know, you mentioned that I've written a few, you know, few other books. I've written 30 books. I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not. You're well experienced. <laughs> well, um, when you're 61... You may have even more books, so who knows? (laughs) I hope not. That sounds like a lot of work. (laughs) But it's fun. Oh my god! I mean, I'm having such a blast. I love. I love this life. I, I'm constantly surprised by this, this life, and I, I, I never, I never dreamed growing up how lucky I would be. I knew I wanted to do stuff for animals, but wow. They, they have, they've done so much for me. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, as you keep writing and keep going, you're going to experience that over and over again, just by finding new animals to write about or experiences or whatnot. Is there a particular animal that stood out to you more than others in, in just your past history of, of teachers? Well, I mean, the octopuses who I knew Mm. were tremendous teachers because they are so alien. You know, and if you can have a meaningful friendship, a, a moving friendship, a friendship that moves tens of thousands of readers in 13 languages to tears with an animal like an octopus who separated from our lineage half a billion years ago, that's a tremendously powerful thing in a time when we seem, humans seem to be so polarized on everything. I mean, right now we're going through these, the hearings, you know, the, the, mm. um, I, I almost can't even speak about it. It's, it's, it just, you're using the same language. Um, I don't understand how, how people can, anyway, I cannot understand how people can hear the sentences of what Donald Trump actually did and think that's okay. <laughs> I, mean, I, I just agree don't with understand you. it. Yeah. I just don't understand it. But, you know, an octopus 
can get across to me what it likes, what it, it fears, what it enjoys, what it finds humorous. Anyway, I, uh, there's, there's potential for terrific connection, but it isn't always happening, even with our fellow human beings, and I think we have a tremendous hunger for it. And I think that may be why the octopus book was so successful. Absolutely. I, I agree. I think, you know, animals are, are an easy way for people to connect with hopefully other people. In a sense, everybody enjoys animals. Well, one hopes. I mean, notice who does not have a pet. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the next the next book, um, one of the books I'm working on, the one I'm really looking forward to, a long book, because I, I write for children as well. And right. I write little picture books, and I write books for um, this Scientists in the Field series that I founded with Nick Bishop. And um, But the next long book that's going to take me, you know, a year and a half to do is on turtles oh wow and i think the way octopus had so much to teach us about consciousness i think what turtles can teach is about time and about wisdom and about aging and i feel very drawn to what they have to show us absolutely i don't think there's also many other books that have been written on turtles as much I think it's more yeah. just guidebooks as opposed to an actual narrative. Well, what's funny is, you know, turtles are, I mean, some of them can swim very fast and some of them can bite fast, and but generally they're slow. And change your consciousness a little bit to see their personalities and what makes them happy and what makes them sad. People love turtles, but they don't always know how to slow down enough to really see them. But they, they have very dramatic lives. We don't think about this, but they do. There, there were these two, this is just, uh, this is me talking to another animal lover, okay? I just cannot please, help share please. this gossip. There were these two fabulous turtles you may have heard about, the giant um, Galapagos tortoises, and they had been yes. living in a Austrian zoo. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, go for it. I'm, I love hearing this story over and over again. Uh, yeah, well, um, they had been together and mates for 90 years. And then one day, she could not stand the sight of him. She bit him, she bit his shell, drew blood, and every time she saw him, she hissed. What the hell happened there? <laughs> well, something obviously dramatic and emotional happened in the life of that turtle. And we don't think of them as having dramatic emotional lives, but clearly they did. And it's a mystery, but they love their lives as much as we do. They have their own soap operas. They just are taking place and unfolding at a different pace. And I'm going to try going at a turtle's pace for a little while. <laughs> that sounds like a really good pace to have, honestly. Very, <laughs> hopefully, dramatic enough, but also relaxed enough. <laughs> yes, yes, well... I hope I get to stay married for 90 years. <laughs> <laughs> and then at the very end, you know, hiss and, and, and bite. Then and bite his shell. No, I never bite his shell. <laughs> right. <laughs> Definitely. Well, thank you so much, Sai. That, that was all the questions I had for you. And Well, they're ter terrific questions. Uh, you know, I just, I love your books and they're very, as you say, they're very just relatable and just, the octopuses are teachers and, and so are the dolphins and so are... The apes, you know, it's it's given me a great perspective on how how animals connect to humans in a different way than than I think the media portrays, and it's it's wonderful to hear you talk about your work that way.